And in this section, we're going to talk about the blood-brain barrier. So the blood-brain barrier is actually uh, what regulates substances between your blood and brain tissue. We talked about this a little bit because we said that it's made up in part of astrocytes, that type of glial cell. Now, um, specifically what makes up the blood-brain barrier are the capillary endothelial cells. So basically the cells that line the inside of your capillaries or small blood vessels in the brain. Okay? The basement membrane that those cells are attached to and then the, the uh, astrocytes that surround them. Those three together make up your blood-brain barrier, or BBB. Now, uh, there's actually three areas in your brain where the blood-brain barrier is absent or scant, like not very uh, widespread. So uh, what we find then is that you don't have blood-brain barrier in choroid plexus because, remember, it's appendable cells that make up the choroid plexus, not the astrocytes. So you can't have a blood-brain barrier there. However, it's still a barrier, just not in the same way that astrocytes would, would create. Uh, it's also absent in the hypothalamus because there are regions of the hypothalamus that have receptors that sense or pick up information, rather, about the chemical content of your blood. And if there are toxins in your blood, um, it can actually help to initiate a vomiting reflex. So that in that, in that regard, you need to have blood-brain barrier be thinner in the hypothalamus that way the receptors can interact with the molecules in your bloodstream. And there's one more place that the blood-brain barrier is absent, and that's the pineal gland. The pineal gland is a region of your epithalamus that actually is an endocrine gland, and it secretes a hormone called melatonin, which is a sleep hormone, right? So if your kids are misbehaving, instead of giving them discipline, right, you can give them melatonin. <laughs> Just have them take a, take a nap. Nighttime, yeah, go to sleep. Now, the reason why your pineal gland doesn't have blood brain barrier is that well melatonin is released into the bloodstream much more rapidly without that blood brain barrier so it has to get the through that missing blood brain barrier to get in the bloodstream quickly so uh, in terms of a barrier it allows nutrients to move in by facilitated diffusion if y'all remember this is basically a process where you have protein channels that allow for some certain molecules to pass through and they're selective in the sense that only certain things can pass through these selective um, facilitated diffusion channels uh, things like metabolic wastes, toxins, protein, excess potassium, and most drugs can't cross the blood-brain barrier. Okay, it's important to note because if we're talking about it's a drug, a drug that may or may not have an effect on the brain, it's got to cross that blood-brain barrier. And what we find is that most drugs actually don't cross the blood-brain barrier. So if it's one that has a psychoactive effect and um, it's you know one that's introduced to your brain via the bloodstream, it's got to be able to pass that blood-brain barrier. Now, the things that can cross the blood-brain barrier are small, hydrophobic, fat-soluble molecules, things like al alcohol, nicotine, anesthetics. Like, those are some examples of drugs that can cross the blood-brain barrier. Otherwise, nutrients are passed through by facilitated diffusion. So we have specific channels there. Now, with drugs that have a psychoactive effect, a lot of times they just mimic what other chemicals look like. And so they actually utilize the same types of channels that your brain already has. So it's kind of like the Trojan horse of drugs. Like you kind of mimic what it looks like and it kind of gets into your brain that way, right? Um, however, this is a big challenge for, uh, you know, research pharmacists to find drugs that not only can affect the brain, but also can cross that blood-brain barrier. Otherwise, they have to be, you know, injected into your brain in some regard, like with a port of some sort. Now, um, what this blood-brain barrier looks like then is we have our capillary endothelial cells here. They have their basement membrane as well. Remember, if you remember that, that, that connective tissue that these cells attach to. And then we have the foot processes, of, or also called podocytic processes, of our astrocytes. So these these uh, <clears throat> foot processes are basically surround the capillaries of your brain and they prevent substances in your blood from just being able to pass into your brain tissue easily. That's important because there's certain things in your blood that are toxic to your brain tissue. So you need this blood-brain barrier to basically, you know, protect your brain from damage from your own, you know, blood molecules, if that makes sense. Uh, it also protects against infection because if there's bacteria in your blood, it can't just pass into your brain tissue very easily. So it forms a nice barrier there. So what were the three things that make up your blood-brain barrier? Yeah? Water, sugar, and oxygen. No, that's CSF. Oh. Yeah, CSF is cerebrospinal fluid. And what are the three things that make up your blood-brain barrier? <clears throat> Astrocytes, good. 
They're on this slide, you guys. <laughs> Capillary endothelial cells. <laughs> and the basement membrane. Those three things. Okay? So astrocytes, the foot processes, capillary endothelial cells, and the continuous basement membrane here. All right. That's the blood-brain barrier. So what can cross the blood-brain barrier? Nicotine can? Alcohol can? Like you guys remember that one. A lot of anesthetics can. Good. Some bacteria can as well. Viruses too. You know, this is how Zika virus affects the developing brains of, of fetuses because it can cross their blood-brain barriers. Um, what's not able to cross the blood-brain barrier? Toxins. Most, most drugs. Most drugs can't. That, in, that includes toxins. Protein. Yeah, larger proteins can't cross the blood-brain barrier. Things, Protein. Yeah, a lot of potassium can't cross either. Good. A lot of wastes don't, don't cross either because those are all things that could potentially harm your brain tissue, so you don't want them to cross. You want them to stay in blood and just pass on through. Now, what these astrocytes can do too, you guys, is actually pick up molecules from your bloodstream and then transport those deep into your brain because one of the functions here is not just the astrocytes to surround that blood vessel but also regulate what's able to cross that blood brain barrier because it's a selective barrier it can change based on what your brain needs and these astrocytes are the gatekeepers of this in this regard and they can basically dictate you know what's able to cross or not cross depending on the needs of your brain tissue so what we're going to do next, you guys, is talk about some of the structures and functions of the rest of your brain. And we're going to start here with the cerebrum. So but earlier we mentioned that the cerebrum was a lot like a mushroom, right? So what part of the mushroom would, be, would the cerebrum be like? The, like the cap of the mushroom, right? That's sort of the top curvature of that mushroom. That's what the cerebrum is. Now we can divide our cerebrum into two hemispheres. You've got a right cerebral hemisphere and a left cerebral hemisphere. And then these hemispheres actually have lobes, and these lobes are separated by different fissures. Now, uh, remember we had gyri and sulci? What were the gyri again? Hills. The hills of your cortex, and the sulci were the? Valleys. The valleys, yeah. Good. Now, um, this is divided into anatomically distinct lobes as well. So this slide here is showing a nice view of our cerebrum, and what we find is that we have the left and right Cerebral hemispheres, this is a superior view. What separates the cerebral hemispheres is this thing called a longitudinal fissure. And the longitudinal fissure just goes right down the midline and it separates the right and left hemispheres. And actually you can see that really well on this slide, or on this view over here. You can see that there's a nice demarcation between the hemispheres. But if you look deeply here, you can actually can see the corpus callosum. Remember the colossal body that would connect, it's white matter that connects the two hemispheres together? You can see that little band of it right here, but it's deep there. So otherwise, you have two halves of your cerebrum. In fact, you can live just fine with one half. You know, people get hemispherectomies and for epilepsy and other conditions. But if you, have, let's say, have a left cerebral hemisphere removed, especially if you're younger, you can live a normal life with one hemisphere of your brain. I, I know, isn't it? It's, it seems like preposterous. <laughs> um, but it's pretty amazing how dynamic your brain is. Now, in an adult, you're going to see some pretty big deficits, though. So if an adult had their left cerebral hemisphere removed, they would have deficits. Like, they couldn't just, like, you know, wake up out of the OR and then be ready to go. Uh, they would need to relearn a lot of things, like how to speak, how to write, uh, and different skills as well. But they would eventually recuperate a lot of that function. So it's pretty amazing. Now, we can also divide these cerebral hemispheres into lobes, right? Now, lobes are just smaller sections of a hemisphere. This one here is called the frontal lobe. And this one here is called the parietal lobe. Back here is the occipital lobe. And they're named generally for the cranial bones that are nearby, which makes sense. But there are anatomically distinct regions that separate these lobes. So what we find is that the frontal lobes are separated from the parietal lobe by this thing here called the central sulcus. Remember, the sulcus is a valley. This is the central sulcus, and it separates the frontal and parietal lobes. Now, what separates the parietal lobe from the occipital lobe is called the parieto occipital sulcus, back here. And then um, from a side view, we see the temporal lobe over here, which is over by the temporal bone, hence the name. And we can see that the temporal lobe is separated from the frontal and parietal by the lateral sulcus. Now, that's the four lobes of the, of the cerebrum here. So you have the frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal. There is a fifth, though. And that fifth is deep here within the cerebrum called the insula. 
So the insula is kind of in the cerebrum. It's deep within this, the lateral sulcus there. This is the insula. That's a fifth lobe of your brain. You guys may not have heard about this like in a previous class, but you know here it is. So uh, this is this slide shows a lot of color-coded regions, right? There's a this looks much different than the previous one we saw, because really what this is showing are the parts of the brain that have specific functions. Okay, this is showing the functional regions of your of your cerebrum. Because we know enough about the brain to know that certain areas of gyri and your cerebrum correlate with certain functions. Okay, so in the frontal lobe, we actually have things like our primary motor cortex, and this primary motor cortex, uh, right here in bl in blue, is also called uh, the precentral gyrus. This is actually the region of your brain that sends nerve impulses down your spinal cord out towards muscle when you go to control a skeletal muscle. So if you're controlling skeletal muscle, part of that begins in this primary motor cortex here, also called the precentral gyrus. Nearby that, we have the premotor cortex, but this isn't involved in initiating movements, this is involved with planning of motor movements. So let's say if you wanted to like plan to grab your water bottle off the desk, you know, you can, you, if you're thinking about grabbing that water bottle, then that would be the premotor cortex. This premotor cortex would send the commands to your primary motor cortex, which would then send the output to your skeletal muscle to grab that water bottle and lift it up, take the lid off, and take a sip, right? So I'm just looking for an excuse to drink some water. <laughs> That's the primary motor cortex. The premotor cortex is for planning. Primary motor cortex is for initiating that movement. So what we find that is that the frontal lobes have a lot of relationship to movement even including speech muscles, right? So muscles to communicate or talk. This is actually Broca's region. We call this the motor speech area of your frontal lobe. You typically find this in the left frontal lobe in most people. And this Broca's area is the motor speech area. So if you're actually uh, trying to communicate through words, verbalize things, then you're using this Broca's area to perform that action. It's another part of the frontal lobe as well. Do you guys know of any other functions of frontal lobe from other classes, like psychology or anything? This is a big one that psychologists like to study. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it kind of it's it's the seat of a lot of uh, personality, you know, morality, judgment, and the reason why psychologists like to study this is well, when those things go wrong, that's when we talk about different psychological disorders, right? Like if you lack good judgment or morals or if your personality changes. So a lot of this is in, it relates to the frontal lobe here, you guys. Now, um, what separates the frontal lobe from a parietal lobe? Do you guys remember? Central sulcus. Yeah, right here. And so, in fact, just behind the central sulcus, here in kind of, I don't know what color that would be, tangerine or something, uh, this is actually called the post central gyrus, also called the primary somatosensory cortex. Do you guys remember what somatosensation was from the last chapter? Yeah. Yeah, sensory endings from skin, also joints, muscle. Yeah, fascia. Very good. That's somatosensory. And this is the primary somatosensory cortex. So if you're feeling things in your skin, muscles, joints, or fascia, that's actually going to be felt here in the somatosensory cortex, which is part of the parietal lobe. Okay? Yeah, on both sides. yeah, it is on both sides. We're just looking at one side here. This is the left. But you're right. It would be on the right as well. Very good. In fact, down here is the temporal lobe, you guys. When you think of a lot of temporal lobe functions, think of auditory function, right? So this actually has your primary auditory cortex. So you guys are actually using your primary auditory cortex right now to hear me say words. And so your interpretation of those words is here in the primary auditory cortex of your temporal lobes. Okay. Now, um, we also have the primary olfactory cortex, which is part of the medial temporal lobe. And do you guys know what your olfactory system is? Yeah, smell. Very good, yeah. So the primary olfactory cortex is actually involved with sensation of smell. So what's interesting to me is that your sensation of smell brain region is pretty close to the sensation of sound brain region. And there's some miswiring that can occur here. And if miswiring occurs, we get what's called synesthesia, which is a mixing of senses. You know, there's cases where someone might smell sounds or they might taste words, right? Because there's a mixing of information here.
Uh, so again, that's where it gets kind of trippy. I'm not talking about like even drug induced. I just mean like it's about one percent of the population, by the way, are suspected to be synesthetes or people who have a mixing of senses. You talking about one in a hundred, right? So does anyone in here have synesthesia? Does anyone in here have like a mixing of senses? No. You know, I've asked that to every single class I've ever had, and no one's ever spoken up. But if it's one percent of the population, you know, you'd assume you'd like I'd run into one by now, right? I think people might be just too afraid to admit it, right? Like, who would want to admit that they see tastes, right? Like, if something's sour, like, the whole world looks more orange or something. You know what I mean? So it's kind of interesting. Uh, I, get, I have a little synesthesia myself, a little bit of mixing of senses. Um, bef as I'm going to sleep at night, words have a weight and shape I can feel all throughout my body. So as I'm talking to myself, I'm, like, kind of going to bed and winding down. When I say words, I, I can feel them everywhere, and they all have a shape. Like that's about the extent of what I can describe. I can't I can't put into words any further what that would feel like, but that's sort of a mixing of senses. Um, but anyways, that's sort of where these regions can get cross-linked. Okay. Now Wernicke's area here um, is actually uh, an area that actually spans your temporal lobe and your parietal lobe. Think of Wernicke's area as not the speech production center, but the speech recognition center. So um, you guys are using your Wernicke's areas right now to understand the entire sentences that I'm saying and the context of those words. That's your Wernicke's area. And it's also involved with understanding not just verbal language, but written language as well. That's Wernicke's area. So how's that different from Broca's area in the frontal lobe? What was Broca's area involved with? What's that? Yeah, like actually producing speech. Good. That's Broca's region. And then what was Wernicke's area? Mm -hmm. Understanding words. Awesome. Good. Now, it turns out that in Wernicke's area, part of that we call the Gnostic area. The Gnostic area seems to be, seems to play a role in the sense of self and understanding your position in the environment. So, what do you guys think would happen if the Gnostic area are damaged, if it's, it's involved with, like, your sense of self? <laughs> yeah, you might, like, feel compelled to, like, go stand in traffic. But not because you want to necessarily kill yourself, but because you don't understand the relationship of your own body to your environment. That's a great point. Uh, what would you say? Depressed. Yeah, you, maybe you're a little bit depressed because you know you have a dissociation between body and mind, right? There's not that, there's a disconnect there. So there's a lot of interesting things that happen, you guys, with damage to, to this Gnostic area. There's one that's also, I forgot the exact name for it, but they call it like zombie syndrome. It's where people essentially think that they're dead. Like, they believe that they are no longer living. And they will tell you, Kyle's dead, right? You know, um, and you go, well, who am I talking to right now? Well, you know, the ghost of Kyle. Like, well, you feel warm. You know, the, well, you know, <laughs> like, no, I feel cold, right? They'll, like, they'll try to argue with you about how they're actually dead, right? Because there's a dissociation now between self and body. And so then what the mind does is it rationalizes that dissociation by saying, oh, if I can no longer connect mind to body, then the body must be dead. So the mind tries to say, no, the body's dead, right? So it's kind of interesting. Um, uh, not as far as I've seen, but I mean, that, that's the extent of what I know. So uh, other functions, you guys, we have uh, in the occipital lobe here. What separates the occipital lobe from the parietal lobe is actually this parietal occipital sulcus. And this actually has your primary visual cortex. So when you think of like visual capacity, a lot of that occurs within the occipital lobe. So what do you guys think would happen if someone had their occipital lobe or if they were damaged, like due to head injury or stroke? Yeah, they would be unable to see or have visual deficits. But this is kind of an odd form of blindness, right? Because you're saying that it's, their eyes aren't affected. Their eyes still work just fine. It's just the part of their brain where you have conscious processing of vision. That's the part that's damaged. So they can still pick up visual information. They just can't see that information. Right? At least not consciously. So why I like the brain personally and why I enjoy talking about you guys is that because it's the place of like personality and all of our sort of connection to the outside world, if that gets damaged, things get weird. And it's, I think it's fun to study. So <laughs> um, now what this slide shows you guys are just some of the different functions of the different lobes of your brain. So what lobe sits right here? On your forehead. Frontal lobe. Good. So when you think of the functions of the frontal lobe, what comes to mind? Yeah, a lot of motor stuff, right? So planning of motor movement, initiating motor movements, and also 
speech, speech production, because it has Broca's region. Good. Now, the frontal lobe is also what has your prefrontal cortex, and psychologists love to talk about this, because um, that's the part of your brain that uh, takes, you know, um, teenager years up through early adulthood to fully develop. And they say that your prefrontal cortex doesn't even fully develop until you're about 25 or so. And that's the place where you have, like, morality, judgment, personality, right? Um, but that takes longer to develop. And this is probably why, like, teenagers undergo, like, more risky behaviors, right? Because their prefrontal cortices aren't developed yet. They don't have good judgment. They don't have good morals, necessarily, right? They're still developing their personalities, right? Which is why they might, like, try to, like, seek out different, you know, uh, identities and that kind of stuff, right? Like, I've got cousins that are pretty emo. I'm kind of hoping they break out of it, right? Like, <laughs> you know, like, how are you going to, how are you going to, how are you going to get a job, like, with, like, hair down, like, past your eyes, you know, like, you're going to go to a job interview, like, yeah, you know, li life's just futile, but if you want to pay me, you know, that's cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, that's a frontal lobe, right? That takes until you're about 25 to develop, you guys. In fact, insurance companies know this. This is why, one of the reasons why you can't rent a car until you're 25. Because before 25, you undergo risky behaviors. And so why would you give someone a car if their brains are still developing and you're more likely to engage in, you know, risky behaviors? Um, frontal tendencies? No, the, uh, the, that part of the lobe is the prefrontal cortex. Yeah, but it doesn't fully develop until you're 25. Now, uh, the parietal lobe here is just posterior to the frontal lobe. You guys remember what that contained? What's that? Postcentral gyrus. But you guys remember what else that's involved? Like the postcentral gyrus and the frontal, the temporal lobe. I'm sorry, that parietal lobe. What's that involved with? Sensation. Body sensation, right? Specifically, what type of body sensation? Somatosensory. Good. So, what was somatosensation? That's in the parietal lobe, by the way. Skin, skin joints. Skin, joints. Fascia. 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 Muscle. Muscle. Good. That's somatosensation. Good. And that, that's actually the primary somatosensory cortex in your parietal lobe. It's also involved with different processing of information. It's got a lot of what we call um, association areas, which we'll talk about here in a minute. How about the temporal lobes out here? Yeah, a lot of hot auditory stuff, right? And smell, because that's the olfactory cortex. Good. Um, in, near the temporal lobe, there's a junction here where the temporal and parietal lobe share a region called Wernicke's area. You guys remember what Wernicke's area was involved with? Speech processing. comprehension. Good. Speech recognition and processing. Nice. So you guys are using your Wernicke's areas right now to understand what I'm saying. Not just the individual words, but as I put them in sentences to know the entire sentence and how that relates to other things we've talked about. And it's also based on your own memories and that kind of stuff, which is pretty cool. Uh, how about the occipital lobe? What comes to mind? Vision. Visual processing. Good. And there's different types of visual processing. We'll get into more detail here in a little bit. Okay. And then there's the fifth lobe, which was deep in the lateral sulcus called the insula. Right? Do you remember the insula it has a little cortex there? That contains your gustatory cortex for taste. So your sensation of taste is in the insula. That has the gustatory cortex there. So these are important to know because if someone has a stroke to any of these brain regions, you're going to suspect, I mean, you'd expect then that they actually would have deficits in those functions, right? Like what if they had a stroke in their Broca's region? Yeah, what about speech? Yeah, they would lose it. No, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't produce speech. They can still comprehend it because that's Wernicke's region. Broca's region is speech production, not comprehension. So they, could, they couldn't produce words, you know, like they might have like a really severe stutter, or you can tell like they're trying to get something out, but they can't really say the words, you know, because of that's damaged the Broca's region. But they could still comprehend speech, because that's Wernicke's region, right? What if, they, what if they had damage to the olfactory cortex of their medial temporal lobe? They couldn't smell as well. Exactly. Good. Um, or how about if you had damage to your occipital lobe? Visual disturbances, exactly. So we see these things that occur. It's pretty interesting. Or how about if you had damage to the primary somatosensory cortex in your parietal lobe? You couldn't feel somatosensory, right? So skin, muscle, joints, fascia as well or at all. So you might have uh, sort of anesthesia or lack of sensation from like an entire limb, okay? 
or an entire side of your face. You might not be able to feel anymore. Because all this requires brain regions. Cool. So uh, in terms of functional areas of the cerebrum, you guys, we've got motor areas, sensory, and association areas. The motor areas are involved with controlling voluntary motor functions. Where were a lot of the motor areas found, the ones we just talked about? Which Frontal lobe, exactly. So the frontal lobe had your uh, premotor cortex, which was for planning. It had your primary motor cortex, which was for initiating movements. And also had Broca's region, which was for motor speech. You got a question? No? Okay. So the sensory areas then are involved with providing conscious awareness, right? So you need these cortices in order to have conscious awareness of particular things, right? So you need like your olfactory cortex for smell. You need your gustatory cortex for taste. You need your uh, visual cortex for vision, you know? So it makes sense. And uh, association area, you guys, these are really interesting. These are the ones that integrate lots of information and it puts that together into, and it forms a more unified experience. So for instance, we understand that, that our, our whole experience is not separated right now. Like you're not only able to see and nothing else, right? You're not just only able to hear and nothing else. You're able to both see and hear at the same time and put that information together to form a unified experience or understanding. That requires association areas. If these are damaged, then there's a disconnect in your senses. There will be a disconnect between vision and hearing or hearing and balance. Like you need all of these to associate together for you to have a conscious experience and that requires association areas. It's kind of think of like more complex processing here. Not just as simple as I hear a sound, right? More like I hear a sound that's familiar and it reminds me of a time in my life where, you know, I was here. Like more complex things. Those are association areas. So uh, the motor areas include your primary motor cortex. So if you'll remember the primary motor cortex, also called the precentral gyrus. It's part of your frontal lobe. And this is the part of your brain that initiates motor movements. So do you remember the part that planned motor movements? What was that called? Not the primary motor cortex, but the premotor. Nice. So premotor cortex. That's also in the frontal lobe. A little bit more anteriorly, that's for the planning aspect. Primary motor cortex just initiates that movement. Gets it going, right? Now, what's cool about this is that it's actually programmed and connects to specific muscles. So there are specific parts of your brain that connect to specific muscles of your body. That means if the, that this area of your primary motor cortex is active, you will only lift up your thumb, right? Or if this area of your primary motor cortex is active, you will only stick out your arms, okay? So uh, there are specific parts of your brain that correlate with specific muscles, and those are, those are important because if you get a stroke to a specific area of primary motor cortex, then you'll lose specific muscle function. In fact, when you guys think of stroke, where, what, what muscles are typically affected? Yeah, I think of a lot. I think personally, I think face, right? I think of like people's faces typically be affected. But you're right; it can affect any muscle, really, right? But it would make sense though if you had like a stroke in the primary motor cortex, how you know an area of your face could be paralyzed because then you couldn't control those muscles anymore. You would lack the brain cells you need to excite those muscles, okay? Because that those things really. So they're they're one to one correspondence. You guys are we say point to point correspondence, and this is called a homunculus. So the homunculus is actually a map of your body on a particular gyrus of your brain. So we say that that point-to-point -point correspondence of brain to body is a homunculus. I'll show you guys this homunculus here in a minute. Now we have uh, the motor speech area, which is Broca's area. This is necessary to produce movements for vocalization. Um, what do you guys think? Do, do you think other animals have Broca's regions, like motor speech areas? Yeah, I think so. Right? Like, there's other animals that can communicate with words. Do you guys know of any animals that do? The bird? Yeah, like birds. Birds, I mean, bird nervous system is different than mammalian, but they do have motor speech centers, and they use that to communicate, right? For mating rituals, for to warn of danger. There's a whole lot of stuff. Yeah, dolphins especially. Now, dolphins are considered a mammal. Like, they're a sea mammal, right? Um, however, dolphins have also highly developed motor speech areas, we wouldn't call it a Broca's region because their brains are different, but their motor speech areas are so developed, you guys, they have names for each other. Every dolphin has its own name, and that name is assigned at birth by the dolphin's parents. 
and then and yeah, no, and then the rest of the pod learns the name of that dolphin, and they all use that to communicate with that dolphin. So they actually use words; they actually have names. It's pretty phenomenal. I know who would have thought, but that would require a motor speech region, right? I mean, and, and to some extent, other animals can use this as well. Now, uh, you find this in the most people. We find this in the inferior lateral portion of your left frontal lobe. Now, we also just have this frontal eye field, which controls and regulates eye movements. This is also part of your frontal lobe, and um, it's right near the premotor cortex, but it just controls eye movement. Now, uh, this is showing the homunculus. So remember, the homunculus was a point-to-point -point correspondence of brain to body. Now, what you see here is the body stretched across the surface of your brain, or gyrus. Now, what I'm not trying to show here is there's not really, like, a body there, right? It's just that it, this is showing as if you could show the body parts that correlate with certain brain regions, right? So, for instance, this part of your brain correlates with face and neck. Or this part of your brain correlates with the tongue. This part of your brain correlates with your pharynx, which is the muscular tube of your throat. And then these parts of your brain correlate with your hands, trunk, and lower appendage, right? So, we have this all mapped out, by the way. And this mapping was done in the early 20th century on other animals and to some extent humans as well. Uh, we can't, we don't do that anymore because it's not ethical or moral, but we can learn a lot from, you know, stroke and other forms of injury. And from that, we've actually been able to develop this map. Now, what looks weird about this homunculus, man? Like as it's stretched out, like are all these body parts normally sized? No, like what, what ones are bigger than normal? The thumb and that, the whole hand, really, right? Your, is your hand really this big in relationship to your trunk or your, <laughs> your arm or trunk, right? Which, what, 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 else is, what also is really big? The tongue. the tongue is gigantic, right? Makes sense because you, you actually have a lot of control over your tongue. What else, what else is big here? You think the forearm's big? Uh, I don't know. Oh, okay. No, I mean, like, what's what's big here on the homunculus, man, with respect to the rest of the body? Yeah, the face. I mean, look how big this face is, you guys, with respect to the trunk. Is your face really as big as your entire chest and, and abdomen? No, heck no. So why the difference in size here? Why does it look so cartoonish and weird? Well, what this shows is the amount of brain matter dedicated to that body part. So if it's big here, that means you have even more body brain matter dedicated to that specific part. So that also suggests that we have a lot of control over that body part. In fact, if I asked you guys to guess you know, how much control you have over a particular body part, you would make those assumptions, right? Like you have really good control over muscles of your face because we use that to communicate really well, right? You have really good control over muscles of your hand because we use our hands for a lot of very fine processing, right? Um, and we use our tongues for not just chewing but also talking. So we have a lot of brain matter just dedicated to the muscle of the tongue. Now, other parts of our body we obviously have less control over because, for one, there's less brain matter dedicated to that part, right? So when you think of, like, your limbs, you actually don't need a lot of control of your limbs because that's, that's just really just gross motor movements, right? Like flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, just very basic movements. Uh, same with your trunk, too. You're just going to kind of move your trunk around in very crude, gross ways, right? But the fine motor movements come from these parts of the brain that have more brain matter dedicated to that. Now, if it's bigger on the brain, that means it's also more likely to have a stroke there, right? Because that means if you have a stroke and you have this large target here, it's more likely to affect that big target than a small little one off the side. So this is why it's more likely for you to have a stroke in your face, I'm sorry, a stroke in your brain that affects the muscles of your face because look how big your face is represented on your brain. So it's pretty cool. So this is all mapped out. And this is pretty constant amongst most people. This is called the homunculus. So it's a point-to-point -point correspondence. Now, for different sensory areas of your brain, we got the primary somatosensory cortex. Do you remember what lobe this is located in? Primary somatosensory cortex. Mm -hmm. Parietal lobe. And you're right. It is the post-central gyrus. Good. Now, this also has a homunculus, but it's a sensory homunculus. So what do you guys think this is then? If this somatosensory cortex also has a homunculus person map. Yeah, how much you have sensitivity of different body parts. So what parts of your body do you think are the most sensitive? 
Mm -hmm. Hands, mouth, definitely. Lips, your face is really sensitive. What, what else would you say? I said skin. Yeah, skin, but not all skin, right? Like, if I ask you guys to pinch a part of your body that's the least painful, you, there are parts of your skin that's, that are less sensitive than others, right? You know, think of like the skin of your elbow. I think, I think the nickname for that is weenus, right? <laughs> so if you pinch your weenus, the skin of your elbow, it's, you can pinch it pretty hard and it does not hurt. Yeah, I know. You can pinch and twist your weenus and it still won't hurt. <laughs> so why is that? Why is it that this patch of skin right there is not very sensitive? Because you, <laughs> so you can use your weenus as a weapon? <laughs> I was thinking it's really thick skin. But I don't think that's the case. Let's, yeah. let's think about with respect to the sensory areas, you guys. If this patch of skin right here in your elbow is very insensitive, how much brain matter do you think is dedicated to that? Not very much, right? Very little. Good. So w what parts of your somatosensory cortex do you think have really big uh, areas of brain matter? Uh, yeah, like your hands, definitely. I'm sure there's a lot of brain matter dedicated to the hands. Same with the face and lips, the tongue, definitely. Good. How about what's what's less sensitive? Um, yeah, feet are actually less sensitive than your hands. That's a good point. Your trunk, you guys. You can't really feel a lot with your trunk. Okay. So um, other sensory areas include things like your primary visual cortex, auditory cortex, gustatory olfactory. We talked about where these were located. So uh, you guys in the back, where was the primary visual cortex located? Yeah, the occipital lobe. Very good. And the primary auditory cortex was located in the temporal, temporal lobe. Good. How about the primary gustatory cortex? Or taste. The insula. The insula. Nice. And the olfactory cortex? Temporal. Also temporal lobe. The medial temporal lobe. Right? So it's a little deeper. Near the insula. Very good. Now, this is showing the homunculus for your somatosensory regions. So uh, looking at this map, based on the size of these body parts, which body parts do you think are very, very sensitive? Mouth. Look at the look at those lips. Yeah, look at the mouth. That's gigantic, and it kind of makes sense, right? Because think about even kids. Like they're gonna go explore their world with their mouth. Like they start using their mouth to explore objects first. What what else is very sensitive according to this? The tongue is very sensitive. Yeah, look how big these hands are, especially the thumb, right? Like this is the thenar eminence. This part of your hand is very sensitive, and the thumb. Good. Yes. Yeah, it would be. Um, what else is very what is what is very sensitive here? Yeah, the, the trunk is not not as sensitive, right? Because look how small the trunk is with respect to your hands and face. <laughs> like you're saying that this entire face is longer than your entire trunk on this map here. What this means is that you have a lot more brain matter dedicated to just your face than the muscle or the skin of your trunk, right? Because this is this is sensory. Um, I always find this an interesting correlation, you guys, between feet and genitals. <laughs> like the, the place on your brain that feet sensation are is right next to the place of your brain where genital sensations are, right? <laughs> Remember we talked about miswiring, cross-wiring? I think this is what would explain foot fetishes. Oh my God. I think so. <laughs> yeah, I know. Ew, right? Yeah. Um. Because you're talking about how you can get genital sensation in the parts of your brain where your feet are located. Yeah, I know. So that's my hypothesis, which is like, which means it's an educated guess, but it would actually kind of make sense because they're side by side. But how sensitive are the feet and genitals with respect to like your hands and face? Not as much. Yeah, exactly. So that's actually kind of interesting. To get what? Why does it hurt boys so much to what? Yeah, whacked. whacked? Yeah. I know what down. that means. The oh, I mean, um, right. yeah. <laughs> now we're we're comparing like point to point. Yeah, it's a good question. Like, so you think of the genitals as being pretty sensitive, right? But we're comparing point to point sensitivity. Uh, like, based on the surface area of your brain, we're saying there's a lot more brain matter dedicated to hand sensation. Now, I'm not saying that these regions can't be painful. It's just that you can feel a lot more with these other regions because there's just more brain matter dedicated to that. Yeah, right. And it's harder. It takes a lot for it to hurt, too. 
Um, now that you could tell though that the diff there's a difference though between genital sensation and hand sensation because you couldn't like feel very well with your genitals. You know, you couldn't like determine the number of you couldn't like read braille. I'll give you an example. You couldn't like read braille with genitals. Good luck with that. It's not gonna happen, right? I know. It's I know. <laughs> but you could definitely do it with your fan, your hands. Your hands are a lot more sensitive. So that that explains that.